Hi, welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis. I'm Vicki Colvin. This lecture, which is the last of week four, is really going to just go through some examples that I think are going to prepare you for your quizzes and your homework. So the first thing I wanted to remind you of is you have to find the polarity and molecular structure of these molecules, which we discussed in the prior lecture. I believe it was lecture two. One of the hints that I'll give you if you one of the hints that I'll give you if you really don't know how to start to find these is go ahead and get the molecular formula. So for example, this molecule shown here in number four would be C2H3N. And if you type that into Google, um, you might get one approach to find one approach to finding what these names of these molecules are. It's important that you have some familiarity with. So what I want to do now is actually take you to the web because another thing you're going to be doing on this week's homework is actually finding a method of your own. And it's kind of fun to do because I'm going to leave it up to you to choose a method and just ask you some questions more or less honor coded about the method that you did find. So let's go to Google and check out the Agilent catalog. So this is a website of Agilent, which is one of the biggest manufacturers of a lot of different instrumentation, but in particular chromatography. I like their website because it has good I like their website because it has good applications notes that you might find interesting in this class. So what you're going to do once you're at the website is you're going to go from there you can see that there's a lot of different examples of solutions and applications. You can pick whatever is most interesting to you. I like to do food chemistry. So I'm going to pick food testing and agriculture. Once you've picked your solution, you can sort of see from their splash page the kinds of things they have available. So I'm sort of in, let's, let's check out dietary supplements. So you'll see a lot of different applications. They're using one which is evaporative light scattering detector, and it's attached to an HPLC. That sounds kind of, kind of interesting. So let's view that application note. All right, so the first thing you can notice is that this application note is eight pages long. It's a little longer than perhaps what I'd want you to do, but still, it's a good start. Now, as you page down in this applications note, you'll see that it's going to tell you a little bit about why they're doing the experiments. It's going to give you some example of the particular uniqueness of most applications notes have something interesting about them, something that's a little bit different. In this case, it happens to be the detector. And as you go down, you can see there's the system they're using is an Agilent RRLC system. Looks just like a pretty standard HPLC, but I guess it has a pretty fancy detector on it. Now you can stop and look at some of the information that they give you because whatever applications note, they're going to be telling you how they actually took the sample. So for example, in this case, I've found the mobile phase because it's a solvent in HPLC. So I know that it's water and acetonitrile. That'll be one of the questions in your homework. You have to figure out the mobile phase of your system. The next thing I'm going to ask you to figure out is what the stationary phase is. Right here's the column. You don't have to know the chemistry, but go ahead and give me the brand name. In this case, it's an Agilent Zorbax Eclipse column. I may also ask you how long it is or the dimensions. In this case, this is a 15 centimeter column. We're not really doing instrumentation yet, but for HPLC, 15 centimeters is not an unusual. So you can read about all the decisions they made. You're going to understand a lot more of this later, but in any case, we can go down and we start to see some chromatograms. So this is kind of nice because one of the other things you should be able to do with these chromatograms is actually go ahead and calculate, for example, the number of equivalent plates. So for example, on this peak, you would just calculate the base width, which of course would be an estimate. So we'll take this peak out here, and it looks to me like it's going to be, oh, I don't know, very, very small, maybe 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds. And then you're going to look at the retention time of the peak. And you're going to use the formula 16 TR squared over W squared to calculate the number of equivalent plates. So I'd like you to go through that exercise with one of the peaks that you find in your application note. It can be gas chromatography or it can be liquid chromatography. In this one as well, they're doing some work on, for example, the quantitative analysis of these various additives that are coming from these herbs. So it looks like a pretty interesting applications note. In any case, these application notes are usually pretty easy to read, and I'd like you to just pick one. You might look at a couple. It can be from any of these categories. Just make sure, ideally, it would be about you know four to six pages long. And if you want to look at a couple, that's fine. It's just to give you um, a start on looking and reading applications that involve chromatography, which is one of my major objectives for the chromatography section. Now I want to do a couple of examples. This is a really good page because I've just sort of compiled a lot of different equations from 
throughout all of the lectures, you might want to add to this page as well with your own notes. So a good exercise for you would be to define everything on the left-hand side and to understand how to apply the equations on the right-hand side. So let's go through a couple of examples. Okay, so let's do some examples. In this first example, we're really thinking about resolution. And we're going to be needing to calculate, given a resolution, actually the number of equivalent plates that we would need to achieve it. The key formula for this is shown here to the left. This was something we talked about in the last lecture. And to just apply this formula is pretty straightforward. We know R, we know TB and TA, remembering that TB is always larger than TA. And we just put all those numbers in and then we calculate N to be 3,600 plates. Usually you're going to be calculating the number of theoretical plates before you calculate the plate height. And it's pretty straightforward to get to plate height. We simply take the length of the column, which is given to be 25 centimeters, divided by the number of plates, and report H. Now, an interesting question is these units will always be length. I tend to like to report the plate height in units which don't make it look too small. So microns is a pretty conventional unit to use for plate height. The second example is a little bit different. One thing we didn't talk about when we talked about the T sub M peak is what number it should be. So the flow rates of liquid or gas chromatography can range a lot. But one thing you do know is that the minimum your T sub M is going to be, the smallest it could possibly be, is the flow rate of your mobile phase times the entire length, including the sample introduction tubing, the column itself, whatever tubing goes to the detector, all of that added together divided by your flow rate is going to give you the number of minutes it takes for the mobile phase to transit through your system. And so your dead time then can be kind of estimated because the column is most of that length. By taking the column length, dividing it by the flow rate, and in this case you get three minutes, but you know that the actual dead time has to be a little bit more than that. So typically TM is slightly more than the column length divided by the flow rate. Let's go through some multiple choice questions. These are going to be a common format for the quizzes this week. So again, you might want to try these yourself and then see how I did. So this first question is really going to require this, ex this expression, which is the number of equivalent plates. And as you can see, really, if you know the retention time of a peak and you know its base width, or W, you can calculate N very easily. You don't actually need the length of the column for N. You do need it for H. And you don't really know, need the other two pieces of information either. So the correct answers to this problem are the first two. On the second two, you have kind of an interesting case because you're running two molecules on two different mobile phases, but managed to get the same retention time. So what can you conclude? Well, since you didn't know the peak widths, you actually know nothing about the first three things. Maybe the peaks got broader the second time around. The problem doesn't specify, so you cannot definitively conclude. Now, the last two then are in the running for the correct answer. And because the mobile phase changed, it's highly unlikely there's the same stationary phase because that would imply that miraculously you'd have the same partition coefficient. What's really going on in this example is the partition coefficient between the mobile and the stationary phase for both situations, the first and the second, seem to be the same. So the best answer is the last answer. If you circled the fourth answer, I probably would have accepted it or given you partial credit. But really, the last answer is the best answer. OK, the next question is one of simply applying formulas again. So here are the basic formulas you'll need. You always start by calculating the number of theoretical plates. And then you're going to use the second formula over here to the right to calculate the plate height. So when I did this, I calculated these numbers. And often, if I give you a multiple choice question like this with numbers in it, go ahead and do the calculation yourself. And then you can easily answer the multiple choice. So over here, I see I have, OK, the first one is wrong. Second one is correct. The third one is also correct, and the other two are wrong. So those are my two correct answers. Let's do a few more examples. Again, you can pause it and try them yourself. But meanwhile, I'll go ahead and explain it. So on the top one, this is another classic example of the application of the formulas we've been learning about, except now you're going to have to calculate capacity factor. In this case, capacity factor is just given by little k, which is the difference between TR and TM. And I want you to underline or hear that non-retained species is another terminology for T sub M. So non-retained species mean the T sub M peak. So you can apply all of these formulas. And when you do that, you're going to get these numbers. And so it's relatively straightforward to figure out that those are the three right answers. Again, remember, the column length is not required to calculate the number of theoretical plates. 
if you know the retention time and the base width or something about the width of the peak. Okay, the second example then is hearkening back to the lectures on partition coefficients. For this one, you just have to remember that you're going to calculate the percentage of time spent in the mobile phase by simply realizing it's always going to be one minute. And so then it's going to be basically that T sub M value divided by however long it's spent in everything else. So in this case, it's spent one minute in the mobile phase, two in the stationary phase for the total retention time of three minutes. So it spent one third of its time in the mobile phase, whereas B came out later and it spent much less time. Now, as far as the next question, which analyte is more polar, remember, like dissolves like. So the fact that B came out last tells us that it must be a more polar molecule because it spent far more time in the stationary phase. All right, let's move on to looking at chromatograms themselves. So in this example, I'm giving you two chromatograms, and I'm asking you some questions. Now, this is a poorly hand-drawn chromatogram, but it's a classic example I give to my students. So, and I'm asking you three things about which column has a greater number of theoretical plates, the larger plate height, which column has a greater relative retention, and which compound has a greater capacity factor. So let's start with the last one. Capacity factor relates to how long something stays in the column. So clearly, B is going to have a greater capacity factor for both of them. The relative retention ratios is act, are actually just the ratio of the two retention times. Now, I didn't draw this perfectly, but you should understand that A and B are coming out at exactly the same retention times. So C would be there the same. A and B are kind of the interesting question. Which column has a greater number of theoretical plates and which has a larger plate height? Well, let's take theoretical plates first. That's TR squared over WR squared times 16. And as we can see, A is going to have a smaller width of the peak, so it's clearly going to have more theoretical plates. So the top column is going to have a greater number of theoretical plates. Now, B is plate height. And remember, a larger plate height means a bad separation. So clearly, the bottom one is going to be the one with the larger plate height. I don't want to do these quantitatively, but I just want to give you some ideas about what to do if I give you a really nicely drawn quantitative example of the time to show up here. So you can use these kinds of graphs, and in fact, I'll be asking you to do this with your chosen method to calculate both N and R. And you're going to do that simply by ideally using the full width half max. So if you look over here at peak B, you can see that the full width half max is going to be almost exactly four minutes. If you look at C, the full width half max is going to be just a shade under 10 minutes, maybe nine minutes. These are estimates, but they're one way to get to W1 half. So with these kinds of graphs, I think getting W1 halves is easier than getting the base widths, but that's just my preference. And so once you have W1 halves and you have the retention time, it's very straightforward to calculate both the number of plates in a column as well as the resolution. Now, just a conceptual question is why do these get broader with time? Well, the reason is, well, the reason is they're just in the column longer. So that's it for the examples. I hope you got something out of this lecture. Sorry for the bad sound I had to do it at home tonight. Anyhow, that concludes all of the chromatography lectures for week four.